Dear distinguished guest, uh, dear Governor, thank you very much for your speech and also for your support, uh, which is very valuable. And uh, I think you showed many of the connections and the, the corporations. And um, I think the tactic of Robert Stair and also myself that the praise should come not from us, but from you, from our, our main stakeholders, uh, was really taken up. And I think that's uh, that what we need, uh, support, of course, the port not only in, in words, but also in finances, uh, in order to do our job and to do our work. And again, thank you very much. We had always very constructive discussions, even if uh, the changes in the National Bank brings new challenges also for us. Distinguished uh, guests, I just wanted to mention and make an exception and, uh, and welcome two special guests, for me anyway, special guests, as I was active in the European Union. It's uh, Dan Mutter Hübner, former commissioner, who is now again in the European Parliament, we were colleagues, and of course Franz Fischler, who is on, on our board. And it's very, very exciting also for me that we have this connection with two personalities who symbolize for me the, what Europe should be about, about change, about reform, about discussing, about strengthening Europe, and not just having an, an additional political scene uh, of overcoming also the nationalistic view. And, you know, you have been criticized again and again, uh, even by your own community, which is uh, sometimes very, uh, not very uh, easy to accept, but I think uh, uh, you know that your contributions have been enormously important for the European development. And one uh, special guest I also want to to mention, he is a member of our board, but he is much more than coming to our meetings and discussions. But uh, with the personal engagement, Dionis Lina, thank you very much for your personal and strong support of our institute and, of course, for many others who are here. Now, many things have been. Yes, of course. Many things have been mentioned, and Robert Stair mentioned already that. It was a special time when uh, the Institute has been uh, founded uh, with some changes uh, already in view. And it was the interest uh, of Europeans, very often also of Americans, who wanted to know more about the East, about that world behind the Iron Curtain. And that was one of the basic uh, foundation and motivation to found the, the Institute. And also the idea of a convergence uh, between East and West, maybe slowly they will come together. Uh, finally, it did happen in some way, but uh, not perhaps in this foreseen uh, convergence of the West being more social democratic and the East slowly becoming more capitalistic. Anyway, the last 50 years have been uh, times of dramatic changes in, in Europe have been shown by Robert Stair and by the governor already. And uh, in the Western part, an economic union was created, a political union that, uh, was created, and of course the euro, if you look at you, uh, being very much engaged in it, the euro has um, been strengthening the integration forces of the European Union. If we think about the debate we had also about the euro, will it fail? And if we think how strong uh, the euro today as a contributing factor is, we always can recognize that some of the debates we had, of course, also the debate before joining the European Union, it would be impossible to think that we are outside the European Union today or that we don't have a common currency. So uh, we should, uh, if we look at all the impediments and obstacles, uh, we should think how they can be overcome by common will and common determination. In the eastern part, of course, those things were much slowly developing. Any kind of revolutionary change was crushed. If we think about Hungary, Poland, the, the then Czechoslovakia, they were crushed, let's say, by Russia, by Moscow, by the communist rule in Moscow. And if we see today, the skepticism uh, towards Moscow, which of course has been expressed by some of our Eastern uh, countries and colleagues in the past, it has also the roots in this unfortunate tradition that uh, 
changes, uh, modernization, looking to forward, democratization has been crushed also in the communist time by Moscow, by Russia. But then came a great leap forward. I would say uh, more successful than the great leap forward in China was the great leap forward in Europe with the dramatic changes of 1989 and 1990. Um, what it meant was, of course, an integration process into the European Union or with the European Union, but it was a decoupling of Russia. Uh, probably unavoidable because the modernization impulse did not come from Russia, but the modernization impulse did come from the European Union side. And uh, that, of course, meant that uh, many trade uh, diversions uh, were affecting um, the relationship uh, with uh, Russia and between the European Union and Russia. How did the European Union deal with Russia? How did it approach the Russian issue? Well, we should not forget the European Union offered a modernization partnership to Russia. Maybe it was too weak, maybe it was uh, seen as an arrogant uh, attitude uh, from the side of uh, the Russian politics. Uh, but it was, the offer was here. And the NATO made also an offer of the NATO-Russia uh, Council where uh, common information exchange could have been, uh, was uh, organized and where it was a, a platform of discussion. Maybe also this element has been too weak uh, to combine, but we should not forget that, of course, there was many resistance or much resistance by many countries of the uh, new countries of the uh, European Union against too close ties to Russia. There, aspiration has been to get away from the Russian influence. And there was a mistrust, and maybe they have been right, a mistrust that the reform impetus in Russia can be translated into more democracy, into more cooperation, into more peaceful living together on European soil. Well, Russia itself was at the crossroad. We can see very much that there were liberal forces, forces of reform, forces who wanted to have another kind of Russia. Maybe they were too much connected with some sort of an extreme liberalization, which was promoted at that time, for example, by Jeffrey Sachs. On the other hand, of course, there were those who just grabbed uh, companies and did not want to go a uh, liberalized uh, Western way. They wanted to reach themselves, uh, by, uh, not by modernizing a country and modernizing the, the economy, but by exploiting the mineral resources, especially exploiting, of course, gas and oil. And some in the Western countries, we, had, we have to be honest, we are quite happy even with this oligarchic system because what they feared is a research of communism in Russia under the, with the then still strong Communist Party and the party leader, Mr. Suganov. So um, in any way, the oligarchs had the better card. They had the better card for themselves, but also the better card for politics because they guaranteed some minimum economic activity and there, comes, there, there came a quite, um, yeah, still existing alliance between politics and economics uh, with the oligarchic structure. The oligarchs delivered some money and some uh, economic development and the politics uh, guaranteed that the oligarchs could enrich themselves. And the one oligarch who did not want to accept the political leadership, of course, he was uh, put into prison and then had to leave the countries. Unfortunately, we also have, and we have to be very honest, uh, and it was mentioned already, it also inside the European Union, some uh, steps uh, back. Also here we see in some countries some sort of a state capture, partly in connection with all local oligarchs, which are supported, uh, for especially in the media sector, uh, and partly without this oligarchic structure. What was the reason for that? Well, we see that many uh, parties on the right were very extreme in this uh, liberalization force and were not respecting the social needs of many citizens. And not respecting the social needs because they were important and were, were supporting especially the, 
the liberalization element with some successes, for example, if you look to Poland, but led to a reaction and gave conservative forces who were more on, on the combination of meeting social needs and going for authoritarian rule a new chance. But also on the left side, if you look, uh, many uh, social democratic uh, movements did not succeed in the transformation process from communist country, parties into real social democratic parties. And even some on the left also combined uh, themselves or linked themselves to some oligarchic structures and uh, were also not really transforming the countries into uh, de democracies. Yes, we see so that also inside the European Union we have this task of fighting authoritarian rules in some of the countries. Uh, and many of us are very disappointed that the European Union is not going forward stronger in promoting uh, democracy in these countries. But you have to see that, of course, the European Union, especially the European Commission, has to respect uh, the democratic rules. And you cannot just... Uh, you know, punish a country without going for the uh, specific uh, foreseen procedures. But on the other hand, of course, uh, I would like that the European Commission would be, and the European Union as a whole, especially also the European Council, would be more strict on promoting the democratic principles and uh, using also the financial instruments which have been created recently uh, to give clear signals to the countries who are deviating from European uh, rules, European values, uh, and finally also punish them for the, if they violate that. But the main challenges, of course, did not come from the inside. The main challenges come from the outside, if we think about uh, the COVID. Uh, where we needed some time to come to common uh, decision and conclusions, but finally we did it relatively uh, soon if we look to the past of the European Union. And especially now with the recovery package uh, after COVID, there was a strong element in it to go forward and to have uh, very strong investments. Unfortunately, I would say uh, some of the advice, for example, by, by our institute, uh, when we think about the, the concept developed uh, on the, on the uh, answer to the Silk Road from Asia to have some European Silk Road, um, were not taken up enough. It was still a recovery package uh, relying too much on individual preferences and not on what can we do to strengthen Europe. Of course, with investment in the different countries which have uh, the need for the investment. So I think, um, in general, I would also say uh, we do a lot of work, and, and Robert mentioned it, and also the governor, for the, especially the European Commission, European institutions. But the exchange or the influence of the work done in the Institute on European policies on European decision is uh, not strong enough, uh, maybe, uh, or I would say it should be strengthened much more in the future. But now the biggest challenge, of course, for us all is the war in Ukraine. Uh, it was, um, for many of us, not expected, even if today many people said, well, it was clear. Uh, for many, I think, before it happened, it was not clear that it would happen. Anyway, what is surprising is the strong decision also on the European side, even to spend European money on, on military expenditures, which was unthinkable uh, many, well, some months ago, I would say, it was unthinkable that it will come. And then, anyway, with all the, the dreadful uh, disaster of the war, it shows that the European Union, if it wants, it can come together to decisions very strongly and very closely, and very quickly. Now, I would, don't, don't want to go into the question of the war and the possible end, because that's all speculation. What we have on the table, and which is, of course, especially also for the work of our institute important, is the question how to react to the aspiration of the countries like Ukraine, of uh, Moldova and Georgia to join the European Union very soon. 
Now, there are many ideas, and I read again and again in the papers, yes, the best answer would be joining the European Union very soon. Yes, and I think European Union should give a clear answer what it could do. But it should not forget that we have still a region uh, southeast of Europe where countries wait for clear answers of the European Union. Uh, and many promises have been broken, clearly broken. If you look for Macedonia, North of Macedonia did a great and, and very difficult job in, in changing the name. And then it was not only the name, the constitution, the whole national attitude after discussion with Greece, and now it's blocked. But another country with very strange arguments, uh, in that case, uh, Bulgaria. If you look to Albania, who, who did the reform, if you look to Kosovo, which was promised if they do certain, for free certain condition that they will get uh, visa-free uh, traveling, again, a broken promise. And therefore, I always say to, also to Ukrainian friends, Unfortunately, I must say, don't believe the European Union if they say you will join very soon, because even if you look to the countries what they promised and where they promised, they didn't fulfill it. Nevertheless, I think, and this is one of the debates we will have in, in the next coming um, years, months and years, is how to reformulate the accession process of the European Union. I think if we have to take up the new ideas, for example, which have been promoted by former Italian Prime Minister Enrico Letto and, and uh, the, the French President Macron uh, to have some sort of a European conference, a European political community where we can bring in the countries like also Ukraine and, and Moldova and Georgia, but of course of the, of the Balkan countries, into closer connection with the European Union. And we should also take up some of the research done by SEPs and other institutes of so-called stage enlargement process that will bring in the country step by step uh, and uh, they have to fulfill certain conditions and they get some integration elements into certain policies, maybe the common market, maybe on security issues and other issues. And then if they really have done their job in not only deciding on legislation element, but in really implementing the reforms, then comes a full membership. But what I want to say is that I think uh, the European Union must not now forget the region where especially the, our institute was, work, was and is working so much uh, on the Western Balkans. And I want uh, again to underline now the work of this institute because it is, it is really carried by expertise but also by emotional support uh, to give a clear answer to our immediate neighbors that they have to be promoted, not to be accepted without the conditions, but to be accepted as negotiating partners for a step-by-step -step integration into the European Union. Now, um, if the European Union wants to strengthen uh, the resilience against uh, Russian or Chinese influence in the Western Balkans, they have to do something. It is very strange that on the one hand one says, well, there's a danger that Russia and China is, is grabbing some, or is promoting and strengthening some influence in the Balkans, but we don't give the Balkans the promises, or, or we give them promises, but very hollow promises, and don't really uh, implement what we uh, did uh, in, in reality uh, promise in the past years. I want also to make some, element, some mentioning in this uh, connection uh, concerning the uh, integration process, uh, especially, of course, with Ukraine. I fully understand that Ukraine is now building some sort of a national identity, or is strengthened, strangely, by the uh, uh, Russian aggression of national identity. But I think it must be also clear that um, nationalism and hatred, which is sometimes promoted by Ukrainian, even intellectuals, yes, that this is uh, not the basis of fighting, of forming a new European Union. Because the basis of new European Union must be mutual understanding, must also be reconciliation. And of course, it is strange in some Ukrainian ears if today we hear uh, we speak about reconciliation when the war is going on. But it must be clear the European Union is built on this 
principle of connection, of the principle of, uh, of uh, understanding, and the principle of reconciliation. Now, I want to leave out some of the elements because uh, the time is running. Uh, we could think about uh, how the new alignment, realignment with the UK is existing. Sometimes I fear that this new alignment with the United Kingdom because of their support for the war is trying to split also the European Union into the good ones, which is anyway an element we have to avoid. Now, in connection with the Ukrainian war, the good uh, countries who are supporting immediately in military and the bad countries, the old-fashioned countries. It looks like uh, Mr. Rumsfeld once uh, uh, differentiated the countries inside the European Union with the good one who go into war and the bad one who are somewhat hesitating. But I think uh, that would go too far. Now, um, coming to the last points, Michael Andersman will remember and some other colleagues that we did some uh, uh, seminars in the past on the connectivity issue with the basic, together also with the OECE, with the basic idea, connectivity, uh, economic connectivity brings peace, reconciliation to the world. Well, we saw that especially in this case, this connectivity did not work in the direction we wanted, especially not with Russia. Nowadays, we have disconnectivity, we have disorganization, we have uh, uh, decoupling uh, with Russia. And I don't think it is avoidable for the moment because with this war, we cannot go on like it was in the past. And of course, it's supporting also the energy transformation and it's supporting the new energy policy which we have to go for in, uh, in Europe uh, very soon and much more <coughs> quick than it was seen before. But we had recently an um, expert from Russia at the uh, Institute who said it will be a world without Russia. When he mentioned that not so much the sanctions, but especially the withdrawing of uh, companies with their technologies from Russia will uh, bring Russia back into a former stage of economic activities and economic level. So uh, the real question we also have to discuss already now, again, in underlining this uh, uh, unavoidable decoupling from Russia, is a world without Russia, is a Europe without Russia a better one or not? How will Russia react? How will Russia react if it is a junior partner of China? Because certainly it is true, China will get stronger, Russia will get weaker. So one of the tasks also of our institute is, of course, now to work on these two issues. The one issue on this enlargement of European Union. How can it be better organized? How can it be restructured? But on the other hand, also on this question, how can the relationship with one big country on our continent be structured that Russia is not going, as somebody said, will not be the North Korea of the European continent? How can a minimum of connectivity be preserved? How can perhaps after the war a new way of connectivity can be organized in order to bring peace uh, into our continent after this dreadful war? So even uh, again, I want to underline that our institute, which is doing so much on basic scientific research, on expertise, also can make an enormous contribution to a new Europe, uh, to a Europe which is enlarged, but a Europe which is trying to have a new, more sound and more sustainable relationship with another country on our continent, which is unfortunately now going the very, very wrong way, but which can be brought back into a new Europe, which is comprising, not as it was perhaps seen before from Lisbon with Vladivostok, but a Europe which has peace and stability for our citizens. Thank you very much for your attention.